The word monodoctrine in English officially appeared in the 1850s. Its slogan originally originated from the local xenophobia movement in the 1850s. Monodoctrine was closely related to the space unit consciousness of America, Western Hemisphere, or New World, at the beginning of its birth. In the West, in 1821, Tsar Russia, which had occupied Alaska in North America, announced that it would move the scope of Russia's territorial sea in North America south to the 51 degree line of north latitude. It posed the challenge to the principle of freedom of navigation advocated by the United States. So far, the monodoctrine began to appear gradually in American politics for the first time. This is the other side of India. India and Asia are open, right? So India is also trying to protect the Asian border, but also wants to protect Latin America and the Asian continent. 那么同时呢，他因为刚和美国是战争结束，那么他也感到美国在这个成长起来，所以他也希望呢能够在这个呃拉丁美洲的事务上呢，他能去主导，是美国来跟随他。但是这时候美国呢就说不愿跟随，尤其是就一个是门罗，一个是。In 1895, the United States intervened in the border dispute between British Guiana and Venezuela, and Richard Olney, Secretary of the State of the United States, sent a note to the UK, directly claiming that the American countries are geographically close to the United States. He said, "The United States is practically sovereign on this continent." During the 1890s, the United States continued to increase its investment in naval construction. By 1898, this investment had an immediate effect, namely, the U.S. won the Spanish-American War, which further weakened Spanish power in Latin America. The United States not only consolidated its dominance in the Western Hemisphere by taking control of Puerto Rico and Cuba, but also gained control of non-American lands such as Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines. Its power crossed over into the Americas and established some influence in the nation. In the early 20th century, U.S. foreign policy was deeply imprinted with Roosevelt's inference that, in the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to the exercise of international police power. Woodrow Wilson emphasized an American mission to nurture democratic ideals rather than the necessity of protecting American security. In 1914, World War I broke out. Wilson saw an opportunity for the nation in this war. A powerful Germany doesn't fit the interests of the United States, and if the triple entity won, the United States would be greatly rewarded for its loans to countries such as Britain and France. Meanwhile, Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare, coupled with the Zimmerman telegram, gave Wilson a chance to temper isolationism within the country. Therefore, on April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany, broke the neutrality. In European of Monroe Doctrine, at last the United States ended the war as a victorious country. After the war, Wilson supervised the drafting of the League of Nations at the Paris Peace Conference. But at this time, in the United States, Republicans led by William Borah opposed the United States joining the League of Nations in Congress. They reiterated the foreign policy of Washington and Monroe, arguing that the Europeans could use the League of Nations to intervene in America. Eventually, the United States did not join the League of Nations. For the next decade, the nation continued to firmly implement the original Monroe Doctrine. This began. Hoover and the Roosevelt administrations realized that the American intervention in Latin America led to the dissatisfaction and resistance of the Latin American people. Moreover, Nazi Germany and Japan used the Monroe Doctrine of Asia and Europe to glorify their military actions, which made the U.S. government extremely indignant. From the 1960s to the mid 1970s, the United States fell into a period of relative diplomatic depression. The United States did not significantly expand its sphere of influence in Asia during this period, and even suffered a major setback in the Vietnam War. It consolidated its sphere of influence in America to some extent through the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it was still deterred by the Soviet Union. So, for a relatively long time, there was no direct intervention to the Soviet Union, nor was there a clear public manifestation of the black and white. Monroe Doctrine. Instead, the U.S. began to develop its economy and generalize the explicit Monroe Doctrine.
In the past three decades of modern times, the United States fell into a period of confusion for a long time because there was no global consolidation of the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, which threatened the national security of the United States for over decades. However, in a later stage, although the styles of U.S. presidents are different and their strategic priorities are not necessarily the same, on the whole, the overall diplomatic style is more inclined to neoliberalism. In 1941, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt ended isolationism and led the United States into World War II. From this time on, the United States permanently abandoned the original Monroe Doctrine and its commitment to neutrality in European affairs. In 1947, President Truman and George Kennan promoted the Truman Doctrine and containment policy. The United States intervened in Guatemala, Chile, Dominica, and Nicaragua, while also fighting the Soviet Union in other corners of the world. It is worth mentioning that in 1962, pressure from cruise ships missiles in Cuba led to the Kennedy Compromise. In 1968, Brezhnev suppressed an uprising in Czechoslovakia, known as the Brezhnev Doctrine, again an innuendo to Monroe Doctrine. These two incidents made Monroe Doctrine no longer directly mentioned by all walks of life in the United States for a long time. During 1979, as the Soviet Union continued to expand in the Western Hemisphere, for example, Afghanistan, the United States felt threatened and revived the Monroe Doctrine. However, President Carter and Reagan, influenced by the political relations with Latin American countries, avoided mentioning Monroe Doctrine. So, what they have done did not defer what Cannon envisioned in 1950. From the 1960s to the mid 1970s, the United States fell into a period of relative diplomatic depression. The United States did not significantly expand its sphere of influence in Asia during this period, and even suffered a major setback in the Vietnam War. It consolidated its sphere of influence in the Americas to some extent through the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it was still disturbed by the Soviet Union. So, for a relatively long time, there was no direct intervention to the Soviet Union, nor was there a clear public manifest. Of the black and white, Monroe Doctrine. Instead, the U.S. began to develop its economy and generalize the explicit Monroe Doctrine. In the past three decades of modern times, the United States fell into a period of confusion for a long time because there was no global consolidation of the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, which threatened the national security of the United States for over decades. However, in a later stage, although the styles of U.S. presidents are different and their strategic priorities are not necessarily the same, on the whole, the overall diplomatic style is more inclined to neoliberalism. Since President Monroe put forward the Monroe Doctrine to deal with the threat of geographical interests posed by the Russians to the United States, Monroe Doctrine has been handled by European powers, including the Mexican War and the British intervention in Guyana and Venezuela. However, the United States has diffused it skillfully and recognized the British hegemony of the United States in Americas. Moreover, in a subsequent Spanish-American war, the United States obtained corresponding geopolitical interests in North America and Asia, and then waved its big stick to other parts of the world. In modern times, especially after World War II, the biggest difficulty encountered by American Monroe Doctrine is the Soviet Union's arbitrary interference in American forces, which is similar to Monroe Doctrine in those days. After Wilson, the United States fell into a confusing period of disconnection and thought about whether to give up Monroe Doctrine among the American government and the American citizens. However, after World War II, Americans seem to understand the necessity of establishing American order around the world and even the world. Until recently, at the instigation of John Kerry, the word Monroe Doctrine officially disappeared from American politics. But the influence of the Monroe Doctrine is indelible. The political intervention of the United States in small countries in the Americas, who affect the key national interests of some small countries, does bring in a certain negative effect on local residents. For example, the United States has also monopolized the control of the Panama Canal, resulting in the lack of a large amount of considerable income for Panama's economy before taking back the canal. 
In general, Monroe Doctrine, as a big stick of the United States diplomacy, has played a vital role in protecting the core interests of the country and consolidating overseas forces to further enhance the national strength of the United States.